Good morning. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, it's, it's my pleasure to, to be here this morning. And I'm delighted that um, a cross session of the media, both local and international, are here to um, hear what the military has contributed to the overall security architecture of the country. And this presentation today, I'd like to um, um, say that I'll, I'll, it's my desire to make it more interactive. And so I've decided to prepare a few slides, which of course will guide us to some of the questions that you intend to, um, to, to, to focus on. And by so doing, it's also necessary to give some form of historical perspective to the presentation and to also you know, put in, in, in context what uh, national, if you like, security, what part it plays within the overall scheme of um, Nigeria's development and, of course, by extension, the rest of the world. And so um, the first slide, of course, looks at national security, a nexus between national security and development. This, of course, is something that you already know, but I thought that it's necessary to place it in context to be able to know from which standpoint that we've been able to undertake some of the actions that we have uh, undertaken. And so we, also within that space, the media is very critical because it is you that perhaps you know, stand between uh, the government and, of course, the people transmitting, you know, what the government is doing to the people and then also transmitting what the people feels to the government. So you're more or less, um, you know, an interface when even you are part and parcel of uh, government itself. So I just thought it's necessary for us to understand that. And um, the contemporary security environment, of course, this is also new, not new to us, I believe that the National Security Advice that perhaps last week may have also touched on a few of this, but I thought it's necessary for us to um, bring it back. So across the entire country, the northeast and northwest, what the issues are is also known to you. And of course, you also find that the north central, the north southwest, as well as the southeast, what the issues are in south-south. Now, now, I also thought that it's necessary for us to have you know, a, um, a backward understanding, if you like, to bring the history uh, to the current, what's happened in the past. And so, as at 2014, when we had the peak of the Boko Haram insurgency in the north northeast, what the situation was. And so, you found, you find that um, at the time, over 100,000 deaths, over 2 million people have been displaced, and of course, over $9 billion worth of you know, properties and infrastructures have been des destroyed. And of course, the um, issue of you know, unfettered access by the criminals to various parts of the Northeast is something that is not new to us. That has been reported severally. And of course, um, you know, what it was at the time, and, um, and then of course, a couple of incidents also in various parts of the country, yes. And so, um, back in 2021, from 2014, of course, to 2021, uh, you see that there have been a clear shift that um, a lot of recoveries were made and our impact was also made. And in 2022, of course, is also indicated there. So there are a few footprints, I would say, of uh, some of these criminal elements, uh, especially in the Northeast and, and, and the Northwest. And so what were some of the things that were employed to be able to get to that state of result? Of course, um, theater command was established and and of course, um, collaboration under the auspices of the multinational joint tax force with neighboring countries, enhanced force structure, meaning that you know the order of battle within the northeast and of course in other parts of the country, we have to do a form of reassessment to know what we need to expand, and that's what the force structure, um, what it also entails. So there was a creation of a division. So at the time. Um, back in 2014, 2015, uh, 2014 actually, 2013, um, Northeast, the entire Northeast was under the you know, um, administration of three divisions. And so because of the growing trade at the time, it was not necessary to be able to 
you know, create you know, more divisions and then more brigades and more battalions. So that's what the force structure actually speaks to. And of course, at some point, we have to have even three divisions. At the time when I was theater commander, there were three divisions clearly that were in charge of operations within the Northeast. And of course, as we improved, we needed to reduce them. So currently, you have two divisions in that sense. Employment of non-kinetic measures, we also felt that it was necessary to you know, um, understand that um, you know, problems of that nature, uh, being of uh, internal security nature, that you need to have um, you know, soft power elements to be brought on focus. So we escalated the non-kinetic you know, measures, which of course in the general parlance, you talk about winning hearts and minds. And of course, um, the federal government, of course, understanding where we were as a military, the fact that they needed to uh, um, capacitate the armed forces by way of the tools required to um, be able to be effective. And so a good number of you know, equipment were procured. And of course, training was also reestablished across the entire domain. Currently, of course, in the armed forces, we run three domains of operations within the land, maritime, and air. And we're trying to also get a foray into, of course, the cyber and space. But of course, that, of course, within the in, uh, services as it were. So we do not have, um, you know, um, if, you, if you like, a force of its own that you could say operates in the fourth and fifth domains. But currently, we are within three domains. And of course, we had to also undertake a you know, massive recruitment and. Uh, uh, over the past uh, couple of years, we've been able to increase our strength for the Army about 55,000. And of course, for the um, Navy and the Air Force, also increasing to about um, you know, 3,000 and of course, about 2,500, uh, respectively. And then, of course, part of the achievement, of course, uh, currently, which have also been reported over 82,000, of the combatants, along with their families and, and children, have equally uh, surrendered to, to armed forces. Then, of course, um, uh, we also know that we have Operation Safe Corridor, where we felt that it's necessary for us to begin to look at reshaping those who have had themselves you know, embroiled in, in fighting the state to reorientate them by virtue of uh, the um, DDR program in. Uh, in Operation Safe Corridor. So over 1,500 um, of them have undergone that, that, um, that space. And of course, currently we have over 600 that are also undergoing um, the program. Hopefully, in February, we'll have them graduate. And where starter parks are also given to them, uh, proper reintegration to the uh, society is also undertaken. Of course, we have also seen um, um, a return of the IDPs to the various uh, their homesteads. And that is also not new to you, but I thought it's necessary for us to put it in context. And of course, some of the roads that were closed, um, we have also reopened them. We have also joined in having to improve the quality of those roads, the state of those roads, to be able to enable unfettered access, and especially for the humanitarian agencies who give one form of support to the other to those who are challenged. And then, of course, the issue of the cheap of girls, and then along with um, other abductees, a good number of them, over 300,000 um, in, various, in various parts of the country have been, have been rescued. And then, of course, issues of safe school, what we've done. Um, um, so uh, a whole lot of other safe school projects. And then, of course, um, socioeconomic activities that is not thriving. And I, I would like to believe that um, many of you may have also traveled to Medigree. What it was then and what it is now, Medigree is when people hear it from Abuja and of course other parts of the country and even outside, um, you would think that it's a place where human beings are not inhabiting. But I believe that as you may have visited and you, you begin to ask yourself, is it actually involved in war? Just to tell you, you know, some of the return to uh, socioeconomic activities that have happened. The issue of return of the refugees I've mentioned, a few who were also outside the country Cameroon, Chad, Niger have, have been returned. And of course, um, um, Akin, I mean, uh, you know, um, added to, of course, the deployment of the troops, you needed to also make uh, 
their living conditions improved upon. So, oh, so many accommodations have also been constructed by virtue of the resources provided by the federal government and both I Army, mean, Navy, and the Air Force to be able to improve the quality of life of the personnel. Of course, we're, we're desiring more, but just to let you know, quite a lot has, has happened. And um, the losses, of course, in the oil, uh, and, ga oil and gas sector, over 1.9 trillion naira, of course, in terms of losses. And then issue of piracy and kidnapping, several pipeline, you know, vandalism, among several other issues, um, where some of the issues that you know we uh, con contended, where we're still contending with in the, in the uh, south south, but of course a lot has also happened. And currently, um, we have no no go back. Yes, currently we've been able to, especially from January of this year to, to sometime in July, to um, you know you know, notice a whole of all, all this. And then, of course, there was also a, a reduction in terms of uh, oil production. This also, I believe, is available to you. Uh, perhaps the NMPC Limited may have also given you the figures. But I thought that it's necessary for you to know that our work is not just limited to, you know, um, fighting banditry and uh, insurgency, but are, also economic crimes that are being committed within the oil and gas space. So we are involved. And so um, by virtue of you know, some of these assets, the Falcon Eye, which is you know, an ISR platform that enables us to have you know, institutional awareness within the oil and gas space has also assisted us. And, go back, go on. and then you know, a procurement of uh, offshore patrol vessels, as well as, um, you know, other equipment that we have been able to deploy to give us a sense as to the security disposition within the Nigerian space of uh, the um, Gulf of Guinea. Our EEZ, of course, it's necessary for us to keep an eye on it, especially um, the, the, uh, the, the areas where we have offshore platforms. Then, of course, um, next, these are part of um, the assets that were procured, which helped us to have some form of fleet recapitalization. And then, of course, um, some of the achievements, um, you know, uh, we've been able to uh, destroy so many of uh, the, you know, illegal refineries and ovens. And then, of course, recovered over 35 million uh, liters of crude, and um, you know, even illegally like refined diesel, as well as um, other other assets that um, that are there. And some of the pictures you're seeing attest to what you've done. Of course, a whole number of arrests have also been made. Um, many of them are that going um, prosecution. I'm sure you're very aware of uh, Hiroki Dun. Um, I thought it's necessary for us to also bring it up as part of you know some of the you know efforts that we've made. And so to that extent, currently, um, there have been a ramp up of um, crude oil production and exports to about 1.5, 1.6 million barrels. And I hope that as we continue to interface with the NMPC, that um, before February, we should be able to get to our OPEC quota. But I, I think I'm not an expert. I believe that um, uh, perhaps the interaction you may have with NMPC should be able to give you more details on that. But I, just to let you know that our you know, um, interaction, our work, you know, working in, in synergy with NMPC have helped us to be able to um, arrest some of the malfeasance that have occurred within that space. Our quality, working very closely with uh, um, customs in the light of um, cross-border criminalities of, of court, and so over 82,000 bags of um, imported rice amongst other issues have been impounded. With this, we work in, in concert with the customs. Um, and of course, in the Northwest, uh, issues of banditry, again, um, we, we are involved. I'm, I believe this is not new to you under the auspices of Operation Hader and Daji. And then, of course, <clears throat> many of the persons and those abducted and then properties that are destroyed within the Northwest. Yes, Ness? And then, of course, to be able to get to where we are within the Northwest, we have to also, you know, enhance the force structure to look at the OBA, that is other about to 
and then reshape it, restructure it, which has helped us to make improvement. And of course, we also leverage on technology as uh, part of the assets that the federal government you know, made available to us. We've been able to get a few you know, um, technology-enabled platforms that, um, that has given us greater efficiency in our operations. And of course, uh, um, you know, enhancing the conduct of kinetic operations, employment of non-kinetic measures also, um, amongst, amongst other strategies that we employ. Yes, please. And then for that reason, over 362 um, bandits have been neutralized, recovered over 156 AK-47 rifles, and a good number of cache of, um, of ammunition. And, among, and then, of course, we've been able to also strangulate the um, in a logistic resupply route for the uh, criminals, and of course, abated several community clashes, restored socio-economic activities in the troubled areas, and arrested several criminal elements, um, including the, the, those who deal in drugs, uh, and as well as um, arms and ammunition. Then, of course, for the North Central, this is also not new to us uh, in terms of the, um, the criminal um, activities. Um, so, Next, again, <clears throat> within the North Central, what have we done? We looked at the force structure, and so you have different operational engagement at, you know, within uh, the North Central. Um, you, you have you know, Operation Y Punch, as well as Operation um, Y Stroke, as well as um, Operation Save Haven, which, of course, you know, and different parts looking at the peculiarities of the areas of responsibility of these operations. As you know, across the country and across the geopolitical zones, the, the criminal activities are not uniform. They are peculiar, you know. There are some, of course, that are cut across, but there are also other criminal activities that are peculiar to geopolitical zones. And for that, we've been able to um, ensure that um, IDPs are back to their ancestral homes. Those who are kidnapped are rescued. Um, the, the militia camps, of course, are also, you know, um, destroyed. And, of course, arrest of gun runners among several other issues. Yes. And then um, for the Southwest, you, 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 the, you know this, um, um, that, you know, there is a, a pipeline that uh, runs from Atlas Cove through to Mosimi, and that actually is for is for products, and so criminal uh, you know elements have had to tamper with uh, that right of way, building close to the right of way, and then ensuring that they use those structures to you know carry out illegal activities, siphoning of these products that have been for quite a number of years, and for that reason, Operation Awasi was established, that have also helped to. You know, reduce the cases of, of this of this uh, madness. Uh, so this is why you may not have been hearing of uh, some of um, those actions um, with respect to losses of products along that line. So um, we've also engaged with um, issues of agitations, and uh, we have worked in sympathy with the police and other security agencies to that tension along that path. And of course, kidnapping and courtism very rife in the Southwest. That we have also uh, has formed part and part of what we've contended with over the years. And of course, to do this, again, reorganize and, and then, you know, the force composition as well as leadership, heightened operational engagements, of course, engage the media, just like we're doing today. And also, uh, you know, engaging real-time intelligence platforms to be able to um, undertake uh, uh, these, these actions. That's how we've been able to, uh, you know, the entire 72 kilometer uh, you know, right of way of uh, the NMPC pipeline has been secured um, very, very significantly. And uh, of course, uh, the dugout was used for siphoning. We've also, this, this, not only did we discover, but equally destroy them and uh, the stolen um, uh, products. And then what we also found was that because of the heightened activities you know, within the South-South region, many of those criminal um, elements decide not to be still the crude and taken to the Southwest to also refine that, also observed, and we had that you know, curtailed. And of course, arresting many of those who are involved. And then for the Southeast, uh, secessionists, the IPOP, ESN challenge, of course, that's known to you, and even currently, 
many of um, the propaganda videos that are you know trending as to what they intend to do with this Yotai season uh, they were also working in partnership with the police and other security agencies to see that that is also addressed and of course issues of um, land dispute kidnapping amongst several other issues and then we've been able to um, identify you know some of the gang leaders and then of course um, uh, through intelligence I've also uh, gotten to know the camps and hideouts and then um, you know some form of sensitization of the inhabitants of the southeast for them to understand um, you know the the you know the antics of uh, the criminals and then uh, what 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 um, they stand to 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 risk by way of uh, the disadvantage that is bringing to the region and then what they will gain by engaging with government forces and then working together for us to you know, um, zeroing on the criminal element so that um, normal life can continue to uh, thrive within the southeast. And of course, um, we've been able to destroy the camps. I read some of uh, their key leaders and then, of course, some of the sponsors and collaborators, um, uh, they're cooling off, you know, in various um, centers and of course also been um, um, going through the judicial process. Yes. And of course, recovery of arms and ammunition are part of what we've been able to do. And then, of course, um, we've also interfaced with uh, key stakeholders, including religious and traditional rulers, and the recruitment of local sources of informants, and then of also uh, civil military cooperation you know, activities to, to ensure that um, um, they understand that the government forces are not against them but rather working together to ensure their safety and protection. Yes. And so um, perhaps for this last slide, I'd like to, since I'm speaking to um, men and women of the fourth estate of the realm, is to understand that for us, we have also desires for you, and that it's necessary for us to uh, create and influence public opinion to support military operations. Now, I, I, I say military operations because I, I speak for the armed forces, as lead the armed forces under the direction of the commander in chief. But then the military there is also, you know, um, incorporating the police and other security agencies. So for me, my desire and my, my appeal to you is that we need to understand who our common enemy is. Because the enemy that you see as the enemy of the state is actually your enemy. And so it's for you to be able to focus, zero in on him, and for us together to be able to arrest so that we can have better quality of life. We can't continue to think that the military is the enemy of the people. And so it's, we think that you changing that narrative, you helping to bring greater awareness to the people, will enable us to be more potent in our actions. Of course, if there are areas where we have crossed the line, it's necessary for you to bring it out to our notice and address them. And I thought it's also necessary for you to keep the public informed with balanced coverage on our successes. I think that it's not only when we have underperformed or you know, uh, below average that you zero in on. I think that it's also necessary to give hope to the people by looking at what success we've been able to um, achieve. In that sense, there will be some form of balance. Of course, I also thought that it's necessary for us to be driven by the, for us to build a country. You are operating because there is a sovereign. You are able to undertake your activities because there is a sovereign. And so if, we're able, if we lose the sovereign by virtue of our inadvertent reportage, then of course we will be impaired. So it's, it's for us to have that understanding so that at the end of the day, we will be able to understand that this work is for everyone of us. It is not just for a select few. I also thought it's necessary for us to promote coordination and collaboration between the military and security agencies uh, um, and, of course, all the stakeholders. And I think that you stand in a very unique position to do so. So I thought that um, I could avail this opportunity to, for you to keep that, to, to present it to you and to keep it in context. So in conclusion, let me thank you for listening and to also say that the armed forces have to heighten operational engagement across the country to tackle contemporary security challenges. And then, of course, the contingency plans that 
you know, that will facilitate the smooth conduct of the 2023 elections is also part of what we've been able to put in place. The police, of course, is the lead in this, but we believe that we'll be at the periphery to give assistance as requested by INEC. So that's, that I thought is also, so no. We will not be at the forefront, but we believe that, you know, where there is need for us to intervene at those to, to assist the police, we will do. So we've been able to emplace contingency measures that will enable us to be able to play a role in that sense. And then there are efforts that are made that are in place to safeguard critical national infrastructures. And this is essential so that you and I can use the infrastructure that government has provided for your good and for my good and for the, general, for the good of the of the people. And those who are bent on having to destroy them, we will take appropriate action. And then, of course, with your support, we we'll have them you know, dealt with in accordance with the law. And of course, the Armed Forces Committee to meeting its constitutional imperatives. We remain apolitical. It's the armed forces is the armed forces of the people, the armed forces of the state. Um, we remain apolitical and uh, we also remain subject to civil authority. The armed forces, as we have it and I lead, is armed forces that is totally subordinated to the, the constitution of the Federal Republic. So my commander in chief, of course, you, you we are subordinated to him and to also the constitution. The Constitution empowers the Commander-in-Chief to give direction to the Armed Forces, and I just thought it's necessary for us to have that, you know, um, understanding and that, 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 that um, confidence that the Armed Forces is totally subordinated. So on that note, let me thank you for this privilege, and I look forward to uh, answering all your questions. Thank you. And starting with Leon, I'm glad that um, you reiterated what the Commander-in-Chief said, or direct, uh, his directive to the armed forces. Um, I'm afraid you say you have a worry. Rather than worry, I would rather think that um, trust should be anchored. Why? Of course, our training, there will always be pressure from all quarters, wanting to induce security forces, not just the military, security forces, the police. That's what criminal enterprise is all about. That is what something that is wrong is all about. But what makes the difference is the professional approach to dealing with those issues, and that's what the military we are committed to doing. And that's the reason why we have ramped up our training in that regard. Sensitization, a lot of um, you know, engagement across you know, the formations and units has been undertaken. And then more so to you know, um, articulate code of conduct for all our personnel, which has been done and distributed. So what, why should they act before, during, and after the elections? These have been codified in, in uh, the uh, SOP that has been um, issued to them. And so it, it remains uh, you know, the duty of the commanders to ensure that the directive, as, as, as indicated, and the contents of the SOP uh, is adhered to by every personnel of the armed forces. So um, uh, my good friend Leon, please um, cease from worrying, <laughs> rather trust and also engage others to trust that um, we keep fit to these desires that we have. Um, Horatius, um, well, I, I'm glad that you, um, you made an appeal. You didn't see that as a question, but I think you've also thrown up a challenge, um, which is the first part of you know, your, your question, uh, the issue of training the media. Um, well, if you believe that we need to interface along the part of training, of course, within the limits of resources available to or who could, but I think that essentially it remains the responsibility of your employers to engage in training. Of course, there are things that are that that brings that bring us together um, 
things that you may not have had, you know, a clear understanding with, you know, you know, things maybe during workshops and and um, and symposium, uh, workshops and various symposia that we could hold together to partner to, for us to be able to bring our perspective, our experiences in the light of operational engagements and how you have reported, and also things that you believe that we. Have, um, we have not taken into consideration in our everyday activities. That, of course, can be done. But I think the primary role, the primary responsibility for the training lies you know, with your various establishments. But again, I, I take very good note of that, and I believe that um, for those who, uh, especially the defense correspondents, um, you know, they know that we have, we have actually you know, done a lot of training together. We have had to do you know, capacity building workshops for them. If maybe because you know you are in a class of your own, I believe that uh, additional has also you know done a lot to be able to you know improve on your you know, on your status. But again, like I said, I, I noted. Now to your question, who funds the terrorists? Perhaps I will also throw it back to you uh, for you to carry out you know deep you know investigative journalism for us to be able to bring such criminals to the fore. But in my presentation, I did mention that a lot of arrests have been made with respect to those who are collaborating. And I also have you know, indicated in a, in a, the, the cache of arms and ammo that have been recovered um, from those who engage in gun running. And I think that from, from, from that, you should have a sense that a lot has also been done. But again, I believe that perhaps you're looking for big names um, that um, you know will be you know somebody who is a, you know a billionaire or whatever or has you know some establishment uh, anchored you know or focused on having to um, fund criminals uh, across the country and beyond. Uh, again, like I said, uh, please help us if you can undertake such. Um, you know, um, assets, because when we talk about intelligence, intelligence gathering, it's actually not just, it's not, it's not that there's a collection of people who do that. It's every one of us. But then, the information you provide, of course, there are experts that will synthesize that information to bring out operational intelligence from them. Mm -hmm. But of course, if there is no information, what can he synthesize? So I'm saying that help us so, you know, by working very closely for us to be able to improve on the on the outcomes. Adebayo, update on um, on the, our attack. Um, my job is to to deal with those, and then of course, if in the line of operation there are those neutralized, they go, and if there are those who arrest, we hand over. Um, I I have actually not taken time to you know find out what is the level of prosecution. But now that you've, um, you've mentioned it, perhaps I will have to ask the IG as well as the DSS and other agents, uh, the other security agencies who are following up on, on, those, on those arrests, uh, on the prosecution. So um, if, if, if you will uh, help me out, I, I, will, um, I will do more work on this. But what you should know is that um, and I, I thought it's necessary to, to, you know, to keep it um, in context. Those who were apprehended, did they claim or did they say that they were not involved? I think that's true matter to us. And have they been freed? I think that's true matter to us. What is most essential is that criminals are taken out of circulation. Let them be, you know, be cooling off. Why the rest of the society have some form of sane environment for them to transact? Right. Uh, I, I've just told you that um, I'm not in charge of prosecution. So this is that's just, I'm just trying to. We're only my. The addendum to the, the answer I gave you was only to the effect for us to reason together 
because we want a saner society. That's the reason why I, I, I said that. Okay. Uh, one donor. Yes, um, part of the presentation that I made, you would have seen you know, the outcome or the, the um, output of our R&D, the, the uh, output of our R&D. It's part of you know, some of the equipment that I showed in, in the slide, and even the write-up also indicated that as also. I may not have you know, mentioned it, but of course it's, it's right there. But of course, it's not sufficient. I'm sure you also know that um, the federal government you know, established a committee I'm a member where we've been able to look at how we could increase on our military industrial complex to aggregate the assets that are currently available, both within the military and of course outside the military, the industrialists, you know, what can they bring to the table so that we could expand the local production of our hardwares. That of course has been done um, of course, the impact may not have been you know, phenomenal, but of course, we're on the right path. But we can't say that uh, until um, that matures, we will not you know, uh, continue to engage with those from outside. Otherwise, uh, the situation will, will, will not be contained. So it's in that light that we'll still continue to uh, go outside to, um, to procure. And sometimes some of the things we've also procured, we've done some form of modification. There are a lot of ingenuity that has been brought to bear as to some of um, you know, the assets that we've deployed in our various front lines to make the impact that we've made, to suit our environment. Um, but of course, um, some of those are not things which one can come to the media to begin to let you know. But all I can say to you is that yes, r and is, um, is um, you know, um, it's been focused on. Um, um, there are so many R&D outfits within the military and outside of the military. There are a lot of engagement. There are conferences, workshops that enables us. And I'm sure you were at Naseni the other day. I saw that um, Mr. President commissioned an edifice. You also saw what Naseni is doing and some of the pronouncements of the DG. That, of course, has a lot of input to the military industrial complex, that, um, which, of course, falls in line with you know, um, your contemplation. So we're on the, on, on the right course. Femi, th thank you for, for your quick question and um, the, the answers. I've actually, the operation since was declassified since last year. I personally made a presentation to a group of journalists in my headquarter where I show them a clip of, you know, what transpired from the beginning to the end, which was not even recorded by us, which eventually through the presentations made at, presented at the, um, the investigative panel of inquiry, which was analyzed. And because that was not available to the entire you know, citizens, we made it available and showed them we took time to look at the issues stage by stage. But you see, sometimes the notion of my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts, is what hangs on around many people. So, and the question I, I keep asking is this, what will be the interest of the military to want to kill their own kids and kin? What is the interest? It's the same, you know, narrative when people would say, "Look, we've, you know, um, we've engaged in certain practices against our people. <laughs> there are forces where we are, are pupilled by 
men and women from the 774 local governments of this country. And there is no single unit of formation where you have only a group of soldiers coming from a particular part of the country. So what would be the interest? I think that um, uh, sometimes um, the consciousness of our people, um, uh, what has been transmitted into their consciousness, um, perhaps it might be necessary for us to interrogate it, interrogate them, and then see how we can reconscientize our people to know that we are in this together. <laughs> that, there's nothing. What do I stand to gain? What do I? What do we? What? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm the city. Yes, and I know the officers and men that I lead. I know what we have transmitted into them by way of training. The fundamentals, our operating principle, our ethics. So, what you don't know, don't make allusions. And I think that I will also join to appeal to you to, you know, real contentize our people, for them to know that um, the, the apartheid of the state in terms of looking at issues of security, they are for the good of the people. They are not against the people. They are anti-people. So, there is no way the military will go out to go and shoot people the way they did. No, 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 no. It's not possible. It's not possible. We won't do that. And we, it was not done during SARS. Um, records you. But again, um, uh, if you have problem with a regime, cons just confine your problem with a regime, but not government. Let's get it right. There's a difference between a regime and government because you are part of government. If, and, and this is also what the, the, you know, the media must also help to you know, illuminate. There is nothing like partisanship when you're talking about governance. No, it does not exist. Government is government of the people. There is no regime, there is no partisanship in government. But of course, regimes have partisan, is partisan. Why? We're going to an election. There are political parties that are contesting. One political party will win. When it wins, it forms a government. The government becomes a government of all of us. Because it's by virtue of our vote. So, if you don't have a few people who still want to stick to partisanship, dealing with the regime, then of course there's a problem. You don't bring that into governance, no. And I think that we must understand that. So that you don't end up you know, making the need to be employed in all those inanities. It makes no sense. Uh, there may have been a little departure, but I thought it's necessary for us to eliminate, I mean, um, elucidate on um, those. Things. We need to make progress. We need to move forward. Uh, that's, my, that's my candid opinion. Um, Bali Musa Ruthers, I'm glad you asked the question. I, I didn't think I needed to dignify that report, uh, and that's why I did not mention it. Why? I was informed by my officer, the Director of Defense Information, that he received a mail from Reuters requesting to have an interview with me. And he gave me a letter written by one Alexandra Zavis making all manner of spurious allegations, many of which have not been published by the same routers. And when I went through, I asked myself, how could man be so laden with evil to contemplate the content to which he wants me to respond? I said, 
I say you should go back to the person, and if he wants to, you should. That he already knows the military, and if he wants to answer, you should go ahead. But I'm not going to dignify such, because you're saying that the military, since 2013, has been engaged in um, a planned abortion program. And that is the military that is running that program. And then in that letter, he also indicated that it's perhaps it's part of government design. And that in that letter, he indicated 12,000 abortions have been conducted, but they have now published yesterday that it's 10,000. And he went on and on to say their sources, their sources, their sources. I said, which source? And of course, there are people who have worked in the, in the North East. So I think, think, I mean, the problems they, that we're contending with that I should uh, waste my energy for such things. Again, it falls within the realm of my mind is made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. So since that is the pos position of Reuters, I didn't think it was necessary for me to, you know, um, call them up and then to engage in because that is outright nonsense. Now, in the report, my name was mentioned that at some stage I was in charge of the operation. Yes, of course I was. In 2013, I was not in charge. I took leadership of the operation in the Northeast in 2016. That I did till the later path of 2017 close to two years. And there were other officers. And so, let me even confine myself to the time of my leadership of this Northeast itself. <laughs> what the allusions they made is, is news to me. It never occurred. I never saw anything like that. Both from the detention center in, in um, Giwa Project, than to malaria cantonment where I lived, where we have seven div hospital that was our major hospital for the treatment of our personnel and their families, and especially the wounded. That again, we had unfettered access by all the members of the media. I recall the engagement I had with the media, all true, and I take them there to all the wards. Except, of course, the mortuary that we were trying to build at the time. The whole essence of having to have that kind of engagement was to say, look, this war is real. The death and the, wound, the, the wounds inflicted on our troops is real. Please come and see, because we need you to work with us to be able to make, and I'm glad that it paid off. And that is why today, this Northeast sanity not only has it returned, we have continued to play our path. Now, of course, we are not unaware of the fact that there are extraterritorial elements who really do not want to have us live in peace, who really do not want us to move forward. I am also aware that, of course, the war economy has affected a good number of people, and so that now that we are making progress, they think that status quo ante, we need to return to it. So those inanities by Reuters, in any case, you said you would interview 33 women over a period of how many years, 2030 date, and then you were able to conclude what kind of extrapolation is that? That from 33 women, you're able to get 10,000 abortions that have been conducted. The report claim that there are some soldier security personnel that were interviewed. Who they are, I don't know. Come on, come on. I think that I, I will leave it to you to do the interrogation. Um, 
arm here. And in any case, the report also indicated that Reuters, I'm sure one of you are here. Reuters in front. Oh, Felix. Oh, Rehim. <laughs> I see. My brother, were you involved? <laughs> The man is here reporting for Reuters. He was not involved in a, an investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. I do not think that he, because the report did not mention his name. Yes. And you have some elements outside the country who were able to interview those within the country. Mm -hmm. And then he came up with the report. Mm -hmm. Well, um, again, I, man, I'm a Christian. What the Bible tells me is that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So I am by this, I now understand beyond what I know why that representation in the scriptures. So, but again, I'm not going to be detailed, and I don't think that any of my officers and men are detailed. We work as part of the security architecture of our country. And I'm glad my commander in chief you know, has absolute confidence in what I do and what we do. I believe Nigerians are also giving us the support that is required. And I think Nigerians are better you know, informed as to the disposition of the armed forces relative to the allusions of Reuters for them to take a stand and to know that certainly the military, the Nigerian armed forces can never be involved in such things. So um, my dear brother, please go tell your friends in Reuters that um, uh, perhaps they may have to do some more work. I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed, I, to say the least. Um, um, I, 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 sometimes you, <laughs> because you asked, and I'm glad that you asked, but <laughs> what else do I say? So, it's not true. Juliana. Um, Juliana, I have, and I mean it, I will pay your fare to Medugri. <laughs> Sorry that you couldn't ask your second question. Um, you know, in every decision you take, or for us, let me limit it to the armed forces, there is what we call cost-benefit analysis. And when we, when we are given a task, there is an assessment that we do, we call it estimate process. Now, what does it entail? It is looking at the tax, the objective that is to be achieved, and then what the strengths are, what the vulnerabilities are. Based on the strengths and vulnerabilities, that is relative to both armed forces and, of course, the adversary, you are able to come up with approaches to achieving the objective and what, how best to achieve that objective. Now, what we're dealing with has to do with economic losses of monumental proportion. And in the circumstance, there is an overriding consideration, which is that the gains from our oil and gas resources has gotten to the lowest within our history, for the period of our history. 
and everything must be done to be able to ramp it up to at least a minimum. And so that became the overriding consideration for us to take the extreme measures that were taken. And I think it's paying off. Yes, the, the, the action, of course, of destroying that motor tanker with its products may have contributed to the degradation of the environment, but it's called as minima. And there are remedial measures that can also be done. But if we do not, there is no remedial measure that will bring back the losses that we've gotten. But that destruction, we can still remediate. So, in some, I do not agree that we have, by virtue of our actions, um, you know, degraded the environment to such a level that cannot be managed. Um, we want to get to a stage where we do not even need to make any destruction at all. And I think we'll get there. A room, they say, was not built in a day. I can only seek for your support and understanding to know the basis for the actions that, we've undid, or that we have undertaken thus far. Um, I believe that um, as we fine tune the processes, as we make greater gains, and then, of course, uh, many of those um, observations will not, um, will, not be, will not be made. Harry. I think your question also links up to her. I share your sentiments, but unfortunately, um, things are not always the way the same or they appear. Um, the ingenuity um, maybe I, I would say it's more of a facade. Alright? And that's the reason why I say it's a facade is you have quantity X of crude. But let me use this bottle for the purpose of illustration. You get a quantity in this bottle of crude. And then at the end of the day, what you get is a quantity of, from the cap. And you say the man is ingenious, and then the rest is wasted. So what kind, of, what kind of ingenuity is that? And let me also correct you that everything that is being made is centered around um, diesel, not PMS. Otherwise, it will consume them. I'm sure you saw the kind of thing that happened somewhere in Imo a couple of months ago. That was an attempt to want to go beyond diesel. Now, having said that, I'm surprised that you don't even know that the government actually came up with a program to absorb people like that. I'm, I'm surprised. There is an approval for modular refineries to be established. Licenses were issued. The processes were properly outlined. The question you need to interrogate is why have these ingenious people not taken advantage of that? So please, um, we must understand that a criminal is a criminal, and and he can always come up with stories to justify his or her criminal enterprise. But on this matter, there is no there is no out of truth 
to it. I'm also glad that the PIA, you know, has been able to articulate how we could improve on the oil and gas exploration and among several other issues. So um, my appeal to you and to the rest of your colleagues is that we need to zero in on the, um, um, on, on the notion of ingenuity within the oil and gas space and let us clean it up. When we clean it up, then sanity can return, then we can begin to do things in, 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 in an ordered fashion so that you and I, and of course government, can gain you know, you know, the whole essence of those investments. And then the impact will be felt by the inhabitants where these resources, where they come from. Tony. Internal sabotage within the military. I will not sit here to tell you that there is nothing like that. No, it would be wrong for me to do so. Otherwise, I would not have any basis to be sending people for court martial. I would not have basis for instituting administrative and disciplinary measures. It is in anticipation of the fact that within an establishment, there are those who will not keep to the code of ethics of that profession. And so those disciplinary procedures are targeted at those kind of people. Many of you have also joined in publishing so-called petitions by this class of people that we have had to deal with. He comes into the army, he will tell you, meanwhile, he has not told you what he has done, that he gave information. In any case, some of them we've published, you saw them when we were arrested and handcuffed. Gave information to the adversary, tried to steal arm or ammunition in his soul to want to give and his court. And he's dismissed, sent to jail. He said, no, because I come from such and so place, that's why they are. <laughs> or that his commander does not like him. And then many of us, we believe them and start writing and, and have so many petitions that come to me among, so, among several others. So, I'm using that to say, yes, but of course they have not succeeded. And that's why we keep catching them, we keep catching them and dealing with them. And some may not have gotten to the stage where we execute them. Because there's also provision within our laws for us to execute such people. But of course, the ones that we've gotten, they, they are, their level of... Um, of, um, the, of the crime that you committed did not get to the level where we just tied them to stake in the front lines and, and they execute them. And we will if there's cause for it. So just to let you know. Then added to that, you, you talked about lack of synergy amongst security agencies. I'm sure you're not talking about the present. I'm, I'm sure you're not talking about the present. Otherwise, is it the armed forces? Is it interaction with the police? Is it with the DSS? Is it with other agencies? There is you know, a good working relationship. And that, of course, we continue to improve. Understanding that there is an expertise that each and every one bring to the center within the ambit of the security architecture of the country. There's no one establishment that is jack of all trades. No, there is a content you bring, another one brings another content, and then when mixed, that gives us the right um, outcome. 
and this is precisely what we're working on. I'm glad and I feel very proud that many of the allusions that we've had in the past, they have been eliminated. Well, I don't have that data, but I think that we've we'll always, we'll always come to the press with, um, with them. But of course, if you want over a period, why not? I just um, we'll get that collated and give to you. But of what, of what use is that? Of what is that? How, how will I, why will I? I'm, I'm looking at increasing the, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of the armed force. Why will I be engaged in uh, renegade? Of course. Some of those data also helps. That's why we have also been able to refine our recruitment process. You know, there are, there are certain requirements that we not demand when you go for recruitment. And then the reason for such scrutiny is by virtue of some of uh, the experience that we've had. So, I, um, so if, you, if you don't mind, I will not give you so that you, you, it will not bear to wrong hands they, for them to know how we usually uh, identify them. All right. Gloria, timelines for these rescues. Of course, I said over the period from 2016 to date, over 300,000 rescues have been made. So um, I thought that was clear, but um, since you asked, and that is actually what it is. Um, and I think if you also put uh, together, you know, um, some of the district reports that um, you've received over the period uh, should give you that that outcome. Okay, is there anything I've left? No, 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 no. That's not true. That's not true. We did. It's like now, you accuse me of uh, today I came from my house to the state house. Now, you go out and accuse me that I was in my office before coming here. And you say I should investigate. <laughs> How do you investigate what you know that is not true? How do you know? I am here. I can't be in my office at the same time. I don't know. I mean, the contest, I'm trying to use that, you know, you know, to explain to you. Are you. I don't know whether I get it. And in any case, there are also some journalists who have also done some work. In any case, we have over 120 NGOs. Is it 120? I'll be 250 NGOs in Meduguri. They work with us, not just with us, with the state government, Bonu State, uh, Adama, um, uh, Yobe. And they don't know, including UN, UN agencies. Or are they, is it UN agencies that are involved? I don't know what that means. This is the point I'm making. You don't investigate what is not tr what 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 you know is not true. I I I have my I I know my house. I know my house. I live in my house. You will not tell me that in my house there are rooms that are not occupied. <laughs> and you say I should investigate. I don't know, am I? That's the point. That's the point. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, if Miriam is online and, um, and she's listening, of course, it's, it's um, uh, non kinetic approach, of course, is working. It's working. Working very well, and I alluded to it in my in my in my report. And I think that um, um, this is what actually we want to see escalated. Military ordinarily should not be involved in internal security issues, but the, the Constitution provides for where it gets to a level 
that the civil security establishments are not able to contain the military will come in. And so this is why we have also felt that some of the work we've done should be leveraged to bring to to resolution of the problems in whatever in whichever part of the country that uh, they are currently. So non-kinetic, of course, operations is, is working, and I think is the way to go. Um, um, and I believe that um, very soon you don't see you know the number of military men you know up on our streets engaging in some of uh, the operations that we are conducting. This is our desire, so that we we'll focus more on preparing for the war of the future. Um, so, yes, Miriam, um, our non-kinetic you know, operations, they are, they, are, they are working very well. Which region has more terrorism threats? <laughs> that's, uh, that's, um, I, I think that's a question we have asked the National Security Advisor when he made his presentation. Let me see. In my presentation, I alluded to the fact that there are peculiarities within the various regions of the country. Of course, there are traces of, you know, some across, but you, um, the proportion may not be as others. But of course, every region of our country has one form of criminal activity or the other. So for terrorism, and if you're able to properly uh, define terrorism, then of course, um, I think that that's something that um, even the journalist himself should be able to know. But I cannot stand here to say this region is where we have more terrorism. I'd rather see terrorism as a threat to the nation because crime does not, is not, is not defined by boundaries. So you could have a terrorist act here or outside of our country, but has more implications on our country. You could have terrorist acts in a remote part of the country, but its impact will be felt in the urban areas. So this is the reason why it might not be appropriate to um, localize the um, the extent of um, terrorism. No, no, no. Rather, you should see it as a threat to the states. Um, so it's in that context that um, um, I would say terrorism, of course, is a threat. It's one of the threats that we contend with, but it's also being um, addressed. Ogundele, um, poor welfare. You know, my basic economics tells me that human wants are what? Insatiable. So, um, so I'm glad that he says some session, uh, but I know that the armed forces today, we are happy, but of course as the economy improves, should we desire more? Yes. But we are not an island of ourselves. We live also within the society. So I believe that the matrix of determining whether the welfare is poor or not must be properly contextualized within the society. And if that is done, we and the armed forces feel very much happy with our disposition. And that's why we're working assiduously. And that's, that's why um, um, my good friend, what's her name? Um, Juliana. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the reason why we're working so that not only do we get our open quota, that that problem eliminates so that government can have more money that we can now say, look, we need our welfare to be improved upon. Thank you so very much. <laughs>